We're going to pick up exactly where we left off last week. And we saw last week that Paul had made a case that our hearts are prone to making idols. Remember that? That we make an idol of everything, even the good things in our lives. Our humanity then becomes hardened by it. We become more of an idol when, uh, and less of a person, right? By, uh, by putting other things in the place of the creator, right? In the created things instead of the creator. He then goes on in Romans chapter 1, at the very end of chapter 1, to make this big list of big, bad, no, no goods, right? Uh, and uh, he says they are, uh, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, and so today I have three simple questions, three simple questions about, um, that Paul makes uh, as he makes this case about judging. So the image here is uh, one of Jesus' teachings, right? You should take the plank out of your own eye before you take out the splinter out of somebody else's. And Paul is going to kind of um, jump on that idea here and talk about judging, like who can we judge and why. So here are three questions for our, our uh, time today. Number one, who is they? Number two, why me? And three, what standard? Okay, who's they? Why me and by what standard? Lord, as we open your word, uh, I ask for your grace on me and us as we dig into it. I ask that you would enlighten our hearts and our minds so we can understand it with clarity. And I pray that, God, you would make this more powerful for, for us than what I can do. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's jump in with this first question. Who's they? So, like I said, we have to go back a little bit and look at this verse, these verses that Paul says are people who pursue idols and they become hardened in their hearts. And he then describes them this way. They are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, senseless, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. Woo! They are some bad guys, right? You look at this list, you're like, it's a pretty... These are the guys you don't want to meet on a dark alley in, you know, in the middle of the night. But when we read the Bible, it's kind of important that we read it in context. Now, when we say reading the Bible in context, what this means is this. We get a clearer understanding of what we're reading by getting the bigger picture. When I say, it's 30 degrees out, you might say, that's warm. Because the context of 30 degrees is that it's January or the first week of February in Minnesota. But if I say it's 30 degrees, you might say, man, that's freezing. Because you might live in Florida and it's July, right? So the context gives us a better understanding of what, what we're actually talking about. In this case, we're going to get a better understanding, a big, bigger picture of this um, uh, the scripture reading by looking at the historical context. So let's look at a little bit of the history of what's going on here. You may recall a couple weeks ago, we said that the church in Rome, who is the people who are getting this letter, are a mixed church. They are a people not racially mixed, but religiously mixed, at least in their upbringing. That's because the Jews were kicked out of Rome during, by Claudius, the emperor, between the years 41 and 53 AD. So that is 12 years of the church being a culturally Roman church. Does that make sense? Right? The Jews are kicked out. Remember, they, then he met um, them in Corinth. And then later on in 53, they probably came back or, or after that, uh, after he died. So the expulsion was lifted. They came back to Rome. So in those 12 years, the church had become thoroughly Roman. When the Jewish Christians came back, there was likely a clash of cultures. Christians with both Jewish heritage and also Christians with Roman heritage. Now, as you can imagine, with this cultural conflict, um, uh, we got to understand where these guys came from. The Romans had come from a pagan background. There's over 20 chief gods and goddesses with Rome. Uh, gods like Jupiter, who's like the main god. You, you kind of know who the Roman gods are by knowing the, the names of planets, by the way. Uh, Jupiter, 
his wife Juno, which I think is like uh, one of Jupiter's moons, right? Um, uh, Minerva, the goddess of trade. Mars, the god of war. war? Yep, y'all played the video game. Uh, temple prostitution was a big deal, common with worship of, of fertility goddesses. That's the goddess Diana, the goddess uh, Venus. However, uh, in addition to their gods, um, some of which are kind of uh, leftovers from Greece, or like they kind of incorporated them, they also were very highly intellectual because in, uh, during this time, there's like the rational thought of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, and they all were recipients of this. So the elitist in intellectualism was also part of the history and culture of Rome. The Jewish culture was very different. You know, one God, the God of the Torah, the Jews were taught the Ten Commandments, you know, they recited the Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, mind and strength, twice a day. The Jews were taught to be faithful to one wife. There's no temple prostitution for the Jews, right? They set aside their Saturdays for the Sabbath, and I tr trust me, you go to Israel and you experience the Sabbath there, everything shuts down. I mean, shuts down. You, there are no cars. It was, it's like COVID once, you know, once a week. Right? They go to the synagogue for worship. Very different culture. The point of this is that they didn't have much in common when it came to their up, traditional upbringing. And so Paul is writing to a church where he calls out a temptation that all religious people have. But I believe in this case, the Jewish people had possibly against the Romans, which is a moral superiority. I, I'm good and you aren't quite there. Right? Because imagine you're a member in the Church of Rome and the church elder gets up and reads this letter out loud and he starts saying this, they are filled with envy and they are filled with evil and they are God haters. And what are the two options that goes through your head when you read that? You're literally sitting in this church in Rome, this guy's reading it, what goes through your head? There's two options. The first option that goes through your head is, is he talking about me? And you all know what, what he means by this, right? What I mean by this, because when one of these characteristics comes up in a message or a sermon or a reading of the Bible, you, you start to wonder, is Pastor Chris calling me out, right? Is Pastor Ben trying to make an example of me by sharing this problem, right? Uh, here's the thing, most, here's the good news. I really don't know a lot of all what's going on in your personal life, right? <laughs> and so a lot of times you, you might think to yourself, hmm, is this his passive aggressive way of calling me out without really calling me out? You may never know. The other possibility is this. Well, if he's not talking about me, then he's talking about them. Them, who's them, right? In this case, it might have been that Paul is telling the Jewish Christians that maybe you shouldn't be judging the Roman Christians and thinking that the, the that those people, right, the people represented in these verses, the evil, greed, wickedness, murder, etc., right? Stop being judgmental of them because you're in the same boat. We'll get to that in a second. Listen, the Jewish Christians had spent their entire lives following Old Testament laws and refraining from eating certain foods and avoiding work on the Sabbath. But the Romans weren't practicing these things. So they probably even still had some idols in their junk drawer somewhere, right? And so Paul is showing there's a temptation for religious people to be very judgmental. By the way, it's not just re religious people. Atheists as well, non, like anti-religious people, can feel equally as smug and self-righteous around their irreligious non-beliefs than religious people can be about theirs. Does that make sense? <laughs> so this is a universal problem. But Paul puts the spotlight on the religious people first. Like in the media, it's called virtue signaling, right? Virtue signaling. That basically means like, hey, everybody, look how, what a great and wonderful human being I am. I give all this stuff to people. I, I'm more loving than, than other people, right? I'm, I, I'm the victim, but they're the bad guy, right? This virtue signaling. They, you're categorizing yourself as the good guy and everybody else is the bad guy, or at the very least, they're somehow lesser than you. And so Paul begins this next chapter, chapter two, addressing exactly that. Therefore, 
Every one of you who judges is without excuse, for when you judge another, you condemn yourself, since you, the judge, do the same things, he says. In other words, this list that we've been reading in chapter one isn't actually, if you think it's not about you, you are sorely mistaken. So I saw this on the internet. Uh, let me try to give this an example. I saw this on the internet. Uh, young people, you'll love this. Okay. Uh, a couple days ago, and I think it might be a good example for how this works. Okay? Uh, hopefully, this plays. So the title of this video is, The Unseen Cameraman Shooting a Sport is Often an Amazing Athlete Himself. So, okay. Here's my question. Where's the cameraman? Right. <laughs> Where's the cameraman? <laughs> yes. But where's the other cameraman? Right there. But where's the other one? <laughs> exactly. Do you get my point? Yes. My point is this, is right? There's some there's a cameraman filming the cameraman. <laughs> Except that this goes even one more layer. Because what's that? A camera. <laughs> Whoa, this is getting very Inception right now, right? If you saw that movie, right? The dream within the dream, right? It goes layers because you and me are watching, and later on, you're going to be, <laughs> maybe you're watching this on Facebook later on, right? The same thing goes with our morality. We're all looking at somebody else, thinking that we're okay, but we're just another cameraman. That's what point, Paul's point is. Don't think that you're not Paul, part of this fallenness, that when you read this list in chapter one, that that's not actually you. In other words, who are you to judge? Let me try to give another example that kind of went over your head. Who's this? There you go. See, I told you you might, you might like this. Um, Mr. Beast, he, why is Mr. Beast um, significant? Like, what's his deal? What, uh, who is he, first of all? He's a YouTuber, he's the YouTuber, right? I think he might be the number one YouTuber on the planet, right? Uh, Mr. Beast is known for extreme videos. He's crushed Lamborghinis, he's made remade Squid Game in real life, etc. And, but not only that, he's also known for his extreme charities. This particular um, uh, clip or, or uh, screenshot is from his Mr. Beast Philanthropy channel, which philanthropy, if you don't know, means giving away your money to, for nonprofit charities. Like you're not making money off the money you give. This channel alone offers many, many channels, has 22 million subscribers. He's building schools and he's digging wells and he's giving away millions of dollars and it's controversial. Now why is it controversial? Because he's making millions of dollars by giving millions of dollars. The question is, is he, is he making money off the backs of poor people? People might ask. Is he feeling self-righteous by all the good things and millions of dollars he's given away? Right? In some ways, we feel very justified in being critical of Mr. Beast, of his philanthropy and giving away millions of dollars, because in reality, it's quite selfish. Except, there's, an, there's a cameraman behind the cameraman. Right? <laughs> there's another cameraman. Uh, you critics of Mr. Beast, how many millions of dollars have you given away? Are you helping out poor kids in Africa? Are you the ones who are virtually, are virtual, virtual signaling, or is Mr. Beast the one who's virtual signaling? Right? We may look at Mr. Beast and be critical of his fame and philanthropy and how it's gotten him, but Paul would say, listen, don't you do that yourself, right? How many of you have ever posted something on Instagram showing what good you've done in the world? How is that any different? He's done $20 million and you've done $20. So what, the, same, the problem is the same. 
right? The point is that we're all in the same boat. We've all judged others while essentially being doing the same thing ourselves. But wait, there's another cameraman behind the cameraman. <laughs> there you go. Who are you to judge the people who are critical of Mr. Beast? Do you get it? The point is this. This is a never-ending cycle of judging. Y'all in the same boat, Point Paul is saying. You are literally unable to judge anyone without judging yourself. One of Jesus' most famous stories is the parable of the prodigal son. All familiar with this? In the parable of the prodigal son, he has the father has two sons, and the younger son, in his um, boldly asks for his father's inheritance before his father dies. Now, note that a father's inheritance is not in the bank; it's in his um, in his land and in, in, in what he owns. And so, uh, the father would have to go to quite some ordeal in order to get that money out. Uh, the son then quickly goes and wastes it in what the Bible calls riotous living, or in one of the translations, I like this, riotous living. <coughs> he's sleeping around, he's drinking away his wealth, and once the funds run, runs dry, he finds himself living with the pigs. It's the only job he can take. It's very shameful because uh, pigs are, to Jewish people, unclean. And he realizes to himself, I should probably go home and ask to be a hired hand by my father. However, the father does what? Instead of hiring him as his hired hand, he runs to him, embraces him, and restores him to a place as his son. End of story? No. Because there's another son. And the rest of the story is about the second son who stayed home, who did everything right, everything the father asked him. He never squandered his father's riches. And he's furious that the son who wasted all this money has come home. It is unfair. And all of a sudden, dad, you're throwing a party for this guy? This guy? Are you kidding? My son? He was dead to me, dad. What's the, what's the son's problem? Well, which son? Right. The pro they, they both have a problem. It's the same problem. They're both lost. That's the point of the parable. The point of the parable is that the younger son who wastes everything and the older son who stayed home are both lost. And the reason is because neither one of them have the heart of the father. Neither one of them have the heart of the father. The older son, even though he did everything right, needs the father's mercy. They've both hardened their hearts until one of them comes back. Right? This is exactly what Paul is saying here in chapter 2. Listen, the younger son, the prodigal son, is described at the end of chapter 1, and the older son is described in chapter two. Did you catch that? You can't judge. You're like this older son. Romans is telling us that nobody has the right to look down on anybody else. We just don't have that right. We're all sinners, we're all lost, we're all busted, we're all going to the principal's office, okay? And that gets to our second point. Why me? So who's they? It's all of us. Why me? Why drag me into this story? Paul, how can you claim that? I mean, there's the, that's a pretty nasty list. And I look at that list. I am not an inventor of evil. I am not, a, you know, that's a pretty condemning list. How can you claim that I'm in the same list with the ar arrogant God haters? How am I even supposed to know that I've done anything, anything wrong? And so Paul then explains to us. It starts here in verse 5. Look down verse 5. He says, Because of your hardened and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment is revealed. Okay, I'm going to focus on this phrase. It says, God's righteous judgment is revealed. Hmm. How is God's ju righteous judgment revealed? So let me try to explain this. When you judge, think about this, when you're judging, you're always comparing two things, right? You and someone else. And all, almost all the time, that somebody else that you're judging has got some kind of character flaw. 
And that's why you, you're even willing to judge yourself against someone else because that character flaw is so obvious to everybody. Look at that, you would say, okay? So our judgment, follow along, our judgment shows that we believe there is a standard of good and bad that somehow I've reached and you haven't. The very fact that you believe in judgment at all proves that there's some moral law out there that is beyond ourselves. We, to believe that morality exists at all, right? The reason that you can say at all that good is good or bad is bad is because you believe there's an objective, meaning it's beyond me, a worldwide rule of that right and wrong exists. So this actually gets into, we talked a couple weeks ago about apologetic arguments. This actually gets into another apologetic argue, argument about the existence of God. This is a little, we're kind of video slap happy today, so we're gonna show one more video, a real one. And this is from the apologist Sean McDowell, um, son of uh, the other McDowell, he's very famous. Uh, he can explain it better than, um, than I can. And this video talks about objective moral values. So, don't, don't get like weirded out about this phrase. Let me explain. Objective moral values, translated into English, simply means this. Worldwide rules of right and wrong. In other words, is it true that there are right and wrong that the entire world buys into? Let's see what he has to say. Is there really such a thing as right from wrong? Does the existence of universal morality point towards God or can morality just be explained by, say, evolution? Well, I actually think one of the most compelling arguments for the existence of God is the existence of objective moral values. It has two premises and a conclusion. It goes like this. If objective moral values exist, God must exist. Objective moral values exist, therefore, God must exist. That's it. So let's look at the first premise. If objective moral values exist, God must exist. Well, what is it about objective morality that requires God or divine grounding, so to speak. Well, morals aren't part of the physical world. You can't weigh them like you can a rock or a glass of water. They seem to be immaterial or spiritual. They contain information, tell the truth, do right, be faithful, and information comes from a mind. And for there to really be a real right and wrong, there needs to be a source outside of human beings. Otherwise, it's just your opinion versus mine. So if there are real moral values and duties, it sure seems to point towards the existence of a moral law giver towards a God. So then the question is, how do we know moral values exist, that values and duties are really objective? Well, one way we know this is it's just obvious. It's obvious. Every one of us knows that torturing an innocent baby for fun is wrong. We simply know it. If somebody doesn't see that that's wrong, that person needs a therapist, not an argument. And by the way, when someone says, yeah, I don't believe there's right and wrong, C.S. Lewis is right, that person will contradict themselves in a matter of time. So I often tell my students, I'll say, if someone tells you there's no such thing as right and wrong, confront them and lie. What are they gonna say? That's not fair, that's not right, as if there's really an objective moral standard we're both accountable to. The other thing C.S. Lewis points out in his book, The Abolition of Man, is that across cultures universally throughout history, there are certain moral truths that people are committed to. Things like courage, things like faithfulness, mercy, caring for posterity. Now, the practice of those moral principles may vary, but there are universal moral truths that people are committed to. So if objective moral values exist, God must exist. Objective moral values exist. Therefore, God must exist. The existence of a real right and wrong is one compelling reason to believe that there is a source for that right and wrong, the character of God himself. There's a moral law because there's a... He says there's a moral law because there's a moral law giver. So what Sean McDowell is trying to tell us is that because we believe that right and wrong exists, does right and wrong exist? Yeah, of course it does. But we didn't come up with it. 
It's outside of ourselves. It's bigger than ourselves. It's objective. It's worldwide. Back to Romans. God says, here's the reality. I make the standards, not you. Right? I put that on your heart, which is why you have an ability to judge at all, is because I've made a moral world. Objective moral values condemns everybody, right? Not just obvious sinners. All right, keep going. He will repay each one according to his works, eternal life to those who, by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immorality, immortality, excuse me, but wrath and anger to those who are self-seeking and disobey the truth while obeying unrighteousness. Let me try to explain what he's saying. Why did Jews think they were in the position to judge the Romans? Right? Because they came from the Jewish heritage. Wasn't God, didn't God come to the Jews? They're the chosen race of a people set apart. So they're like, hey, I'm Jewish. I'm good with God. I'm in. I'm on the inside. They're automatically good with God because of the race. But Paul makes it clear that God will repay everyone according to their race. Is that what it says? God will repay everyone according to their language? No, it says according to their works. Whoa, pastor, hold up, hold up. I've learned, I've been coming to church for a long time and you and Pastor Ben and my Sunday school teachers keep saying things like Ephesians, right? It is by faith you are saved, through grace it is a gift of God, not by works. So wait a second, Paul is Paul saying that he will repay each one according to his works? Which one is it? It is my works or it is not my works? Do you, do you see the dilemma here? Let me explain this, okay? It is by works, but for you, it is not by your works. Catch this clearly, guys. It is by works, but it is not by your works. It is by Christ's work. For the Christian, right? We have Christ in us, his work on the cross. We, that's why we say God, Christ's work on the cross. What he did on the cross for us is enough to be our substitute. And the reason you need this is because everyone, Jew or Greek, everyone is going to be repaid by their works. So listen, guys, you will one day go to heaven and you are going to either say, look what I did. Look what I did with my life. Look at all my works. Spoiler alert. It ain't gonna be good enough. You know this, and that's why Ephesians, same author, Paul writing in Ephesians says, it's not by your works so that no one can boast, but it is by works, by Christ's work, right? So I, those are two choices. You either go to heaven, you show them what you did, it won't be good enough, or you'll say, in your humility, I claim the work of Christ on the cross over me. And in that moment, God will reward you. He says he will repay you, he'll reward you with eternal life, verse seven. Eternal life to those who are persistent. So, um, so these are the three questions. Who's they? What do we say about who's they? It's all of us. Why me? Because there's a moral objective law and unfortunately, I don't, I can't, and it's gonna be repaid by works and my own personal works ain't good enough, but Jesus's is. So let's talk, let's talk about the third part, by what standard? So how can I know by what stand, uh, we can know the standard because it's been told to us, and that is what the law is, the rules to, of how to become right. So if you want a definition of the law in the Bible, the rules about how to become right, that is the standard. Let's look at what Paul says. For all who sin without the law, will also perish without the law. This is very confusing, I know. We'll slow down and try to get it. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. So if you don't have it, you're gonna perish without it. But if you do have it, the rules, you're gonna be judged by what you got. It's fair. 13, for the hearers of the law are not righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. So here he's talking to the Jewish people who said, hey, I'm Jewish. I've got the right, you know, ethnic lineage to be good with God. 
And, and Paul says, no, you don't. It's not about that. It's not just because you heard it. It's not because you sat in the, in the tabernacle one day, right? Or in the synagogue one day, and some, guy, some teacher got up and said, you're Jewish and you're good to go. No, he says, not just hearers, but doers. Jewish Christians who are sitting in Rome. And so he's, he's saying, don't think that you're good to go just because you're, you think you're ethnically there, right? I'm looking at you, Jewish Christians, he might say. You're not righteous until you do it. So the question is, so have you? Have you done it? Are you righteous before God because you've done it? And of course, he would then say, be truthful. Have you been perfectly honest? Have you always chosen love instead of revenge? Have you always never given into temptation? Have you never cheated or lied or stealed? Have you never had sex outside of marriage? Have you never had lust in your heart for someone? Have you ever, never hated anyone? You name it, and the list goes on and on and on. Has your heart, I mean, if we're totally honest with ourselves, no one, no Jew, no Christian even can say, yeah, I'm perfect. I got it all together. My heart's never felt any of those things. No, the law has shown us the standard perfection and no one can stand to it. Every single human who's heard the law will fall short of the standard of living righteously. But what about the other part? What about that first, you talked about the people who got the law, so I'm gonna be judged by the law and obviously I already know I don't fit in. But what about those people? who have never heard, right? I will get to that in a second. Um, there is a story of, about a secular, uh, or a professor at a secular university, and she was told her students to read the Sermon on the Mount. Now, most of these students have never heard the Sermon on the Mount. Just to ref for, let me refresh you what's in it. It's Matthew 5 through 7, and it starts off with the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who the world basically thinks are worthless, right? Uh, the Lord's Prayer. Then he talks about murder begins in the heart. Then he says adultery begins in the heart. Then he says you gotta rip out your eye if you start to lust. Then he says you need to turn in the cheek. Then he says if you someone steals your shirt, give him your cloak. And people read this, right? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And the people reading this who never read it before, write back and turn to the professor and say, I hated the, the, the Sermon on the Mount. I hated reading that because it made me feel like I needed to be perfect. And they all gave their, their critique and their scorn for Jesus' primary teaching, the Sermon on the Mount. And knowing that the, the, this professor, knowing that this is where they come, the conclusion they come to, she then asked them a question. But aren't these the kind of people that you expect in your life? Aren't the type of people that Jesus is writing about the people that you expect to be kind when you're not all together there, that are always loving to you, that will forgive you when you screw them over, or other people, you expect that of other people. The point is this, that upon reading the Sermon on the Mount, they realize, and the class got very silent, they realize that they expect other people to be the type of person that they themselves are not willing to be, right? You want everyone else to be held to the standard, but you're not willing to be held to it yourself. Okay, so let's get to this third group of, uh, this other group of people. We say, well, what about the people who've never received the law? They have not, either never received it because they're, you know, they're the, they, we like to say the Aborigines out in Australia who've never heard the Bible, they've never heard the name of Jesus, they've never heard the Old Testament, they've never heard anything about God, right? for decades and for years. It's totally not fair that God would say, look at my law, all, all the things to make you righteous, to make you a, right, a good person. They never received it, so they can be like, well, God, it's not fair because I never got that. Well, what do we do about those people, right? Can you just opt out of the whole thing? In fact, people do try to opt out of the whole thing. There's plenty of people who were raised in church and they get to this point where they read about that God is actually gonna judge you and they start to walk out of the church a little bit backwards. They think, no, I did not sign up for this part of, of Christianity. That there's a God who judges me? No, no thank you. I think I can do this on my own. And so they claim atheism, they claim agnosticism, they just ignore God in the church. They live as if spiritual things don't matter. You know who these people are, right? But one day, they will go to heaven, and God will judge them. But they're gonna say, well, God, you can't do this to me because I didn't agree to this. 
I didn't agree to your law. I didn't agree to any law. I didn't even read your word, right? <laughs> I sat in church, I didn't listen. No one came and told me. I never had this opportunity to you know. Well, what then? Because that's a fair point, right? Well, Francis Schaeffer is a guy who's an American theologian. He died in 1984. He gave this illustration. It's brilliant. One of the people have heard. He gave this illustration. He says this. Imagine you had a tape recorder, an invisible tape recorder around your neck, and that every time you talked about a moral truth, right? That somehow you're, you're, you're good and other people are not. Every time you, that came out of your mouth, it got recorded. And this invisible tape recorder recorded that time that that lady should have done that to you, or that man should have said this to you, right? Or believe this about you. And, and he writes that this tape recorder would then, one day when you go to heaven and stand before God, all of a sudden it just magically appears around your neck and you're like, what's that? And God's like, it's always been there, let's play it. And like, no thank you. He's like, yeah, let's play it. And then God and you and everybody else who's in that courtroom can listen to all your moral standards. You should have done this, right? He, Schaefer says that that tape recorder would probably play for years. And at the end of it, God would say, okay, listen, I'm going to be the most impartial, most fair judge of all. The only rule of, of how the, you didn't get the law, so let's use this law, your own words. Let's use your standard for what is good and bad. And if you lived up to it, how many people would live up to their own recording? Not a one. Every soul in all of history could not even live up to their own standard. They expect others to be what they cannot. Everyone will be silenced. Schaefer's point is this, you cannot stand up to your own standards you set for others. And he ends by saying this, God is completely just. A man is judged and found wanting on the same basis on which he tries to bind others. And Paul puts it this way, uh, verse 14, did I get it? So when Gentiles who do not by nature have the law follow along, right? When they don't have the law, but they do what the law demands, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They don't have those rules of how to be righteous. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Their consciences confirm this. Their competing thoughts either accuse or even excuse them on the day when God judges what people have kept in secret. Okay? I know this is confusing, but listen, this, it's a sober thought. But the one thing that unifies our entire world is this. We are all subject to God's judgment and not a single one of us in our own works will make it. So, Let's just end this with this. Wow, that's a huge downer, Chris. <laughs> I liked your YouTube videos, but the, that's a huge downer. Let's end with this. Um, Paul says, don't take God for granted. The fact that you are alive every single day has shown, uh, uh, shows that God has shown me his kindness, okay? And so I want you to think, think as we walk away from today, what is the point that Pastor Chris is trying to make to you today? You could walk away from this, from my message today and say, well, that was a lot, but I think what he meant for me to understand is this. I just, just not be a judging person. And if that's all you got, that's actually good, but that's not the point. The real point of today is this, that we are all condemned. Paul is saying all of us, the prodigal sons, the older sons, and even those who don't believe at all, right? They will be judged by their own standards and they cannot stand to that. They'll be judged by the standards by which they judge others. And if you walk away from today saying, wow, Pastor Chris, that was a serious message and that was a major bummer, then hopefully you come to this simple conclusion and that's this. We sure do need a savior. Amen? We sure do need a savior. Let's close with that. Our Father, uh, as we dig into these really meaty and deep passages, 
I pray um, that we look at this and not walk away and try to push against it, but instead look at it and say, actually, this is a gift for me to realize, man, I really do need a savior. I really do need to stop re relying and depending on myself and all the things that the world has told me, oh, you're great, you're good enough. No, I am not okay. I desperately, desperately need Jesus. And so I'm, that, that causes me, once I realize the depth of my need, I realize the greatness of his sacrifice, the greatness of the gift of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus, I thank you that you've loved me and you've saved me. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.